the eastern end of the Tibetan Plateau in China's Sichuan province. Prayer flags flutter in the wind. Tibetan Buddhists hang these flags to pray for blessings on their families and peace in the world. Some are printed with sutras, the Buddhist scriptures. Tibetans believe that the wind flapping the flags will carry the teachings of the Buddha to all living things. The Surta Larunga Buddhist Institute in Gansu, Tibetan Autonomous Prefecture is the world's largest center of Tibetan Buddhist learning. The Sutra Halls at the center of this 4,000 meter high valley are where the monks and nuns study. The slopes of the valley are blanketed in tiny wooden dwellings. 20,000 people live and study here, 8,000 monks and 12,000 nuns. At the institute, they study both Tibetan Buddhism and traditional culture. Isolated from the world, they spend their days in prayer and ascetic practices. Even the highest lamas devote every waking moment to the quest for ultimate truth. The Institute has received almost no media coverage. Foreign media are not permitted here. This footage was taken over the course of about one year by a young Chinese filmmaker. It shows the Spartan life of these monks and nuns in training, who have left everything and everyone behind. Here, an ancient Tibetan Buddhist ritual is still practiced. Sky burial is the disposal of corpses by feeding them to birds. For those who believe in reincarnation, this is seen as a final act of merit to gain happiness in the next life. Among the institute's students are many Han Chinese, disillusioned with China's breakneck economic growth, seeking answers in religion. The Grand Dharma Assembly is held each fall. Over 40,000 people gather at this time and pray to attain liberation like Amida Buddha from all worldly passions. This program gives an unprecedented inside look at the Larunga Institute and the religion and culture of China's Tibetan Buddhists. Winter temperatures in the Larong Valley can fall as low as minus 36 degrees Celsius. Snowfall in the valley is not heavy, but the winds are strong and bitterly cold. The sound of a conch shell announces the start of each day's training. Student monks and nuns gather at the sutra halls for instruction and training. 
A lama has begun his lecture in the sutra hall for the monks. This courtyard seats 2,000 students. The nuns study in this sutra hall. Training takes place in galleries on each floor and in the courtyard. The main subjects of study are Buddhist scriptures, Buddhist history, astronomy, ethics, and Sanskrit. The formal term of study at the institute is six years. An advanced degree requires 13 years. But there are no hard and fast rules, and many spend their whole lives here. Some of these students are still children. Tibetan Buddhists believe that a monk in the family brings honor, and second sons traditionally become monks. Many of the boys here left home before age 10. This young monk came to the institute at age five and has been studying here for 20 years. His name is Sudim Tenjin. Although he already holds a degree, today, like every day, he will study from 5 a.m. to midnight. For Tsudim, there is no end to the truths to be discovered in the Buddhist scriptures. For a follower of Buddhism, stubbornly seeking after anything is not good. We should not be seeking to possess money or material things, but instead to focus on spiritual enlightenment. For a student, the most important thing is how you use your time. You must not waste a single minute or even a second. If you do, it will be cause for regret later. To master your use of time is to master yourself. That is why I discipline myself and study without rest, all day, every day. The Tibetans call this region Kham. Over a century ago, there was a training center for monks here, but it was demolished during China's Cultural Revolution. Then in 1980, a famous lama called Jigme Punsak opened a study center here. In the beginning, there were only about 30 monks. In 1997, it was officially recognized by the government of Sichuan province as an educational and research institution on Tibetan Buddhism. The institute is distinctive for accepting monks and nuns from all of Tibetan Buddhism's many sects. Its 20,000 students make it the world's largest Tibetan Buddhist academy. Near the entrance to the Larung Valley stands the Sutra Hall for lay practitioners. People come here not only from the surrounding region, but from all over China. Each time one spins a handheld prayer wheel, it counts as a recitation of a sutra. Pouring water into bowls is a simplified substitute for offering of flowers, incense, or candles. After the Lama has finished his lecture, he goes to greet pilgrims outside the Sutra Hall. People are excited to be touched by this highly respected monk. The institute's name Larung is a contraction of the Tibetan phrase Lama Lungwa, meaning recognized as a high-level monk. For the scores of pilgrims who flock here to hear him each day, there is a high monk who embodies the institute's name. Tenjin Gyatso is 46 years old and the highest-ranking monk of Larun Institute. He is a tulko, 
a living Buddha who is a reincarnation of a famous Lama. At age 19, he met Institute founder Jigme Punsok, who invited him to Laron. When Jigme Punsok died 10 years ago, Tenjin Gyatso became head of the institute. What is a tulko, and uh, what does it mean? A tulku is an incarnation of a Buddha manifesting in this world. The highest incarnation is as a human being. Prince Gautama Siddhartha became Buddha. A tulku can also be an animal or plant, a wind or a stone. Tulku take many forms in order to save all living beings. All beings repeatedly undergo the cycle of birth, death and then rebirth in another form. Once one achieves enlightenment and liberation from worldly passions, one becomes a Buddha. Then, one incarnates again in this world as a tulku to guide others to salvation. After he finishes teaching, the tulku lama holds an audience with the pilgrims. He hands them yellow packets containing traditional Tibetan Buddhist herbs. The pilgrims leave offerings of many different kinds, from yak milk and butter, to fruit and other foods, clothes, shoes, and even money. Overlooking the Sutra Hall is one more place that pilgrims to the Institute always visit. As pilgrims walk clockwise around the gallery at the base of the stupa, they spin these giant prayer wheels. Each spin of a prayer wheel earns the same merit as reciting a sutra. 108 ritual prostrations done while reciting the sutras are the traditional way to express devotion to the Buddha. In the center of the stupa is a gorgeous palace. Here the Buddha dwells, surrounded by guardian deities. This whole stupa is in the form of a mandala, an abstract representation of Buddhist cosmology, with the Buddha at its center. This is a Kala Chakra. In the center is Mount Meru, the mountain at the center of the cosmos where the Buddha dwells. Surrounding it are first the gods, then the world of humans and animals. All living beings undergo the suffering of this cycle of life and death, being reborn over and over. The only way to be liberated from this cycle is to accumulate sufficient merit and achieve enlightenment. This is the philosophy of Tibetan Buddhism. The Lama Tsutum Lodu has the honored title of Kempo, a great scholar qualified to head a major temple. He is the head of instruction at the institute, responsible for the student's education. His many books, giving profound insights into life and death, are well known even in the Western world. Everyone wants to know what happens to people after they die. In reality, it is similar to the daily cycle of falling asleep and then waking up again. When people sleep deeply, they enter the world of dreams, and when they awaken, they return to the real world. Although the cycle is longer, the same principle applies to life and death. Usually, when a person dies, they remain in a dream state for seven weeks, for 49 days in all. And then the time comes for them to be reborn. And this rebirth process is the same as waking from a sleep. People tend to fear death, thinking it is nothing more than oblivion. But if you believe and study Tibetan Buddhism,
you come to realize that the process of death is no different from that of sleep. In other words, the purpose of death is simply so that we can then be reborn. It's nothing to be feared at all. When someone dies in this region, rituals are performed in the home and then relatives and friends carry the corpse here to Lalon Institute. Tibetan Buddhist funeral rites are seen as a way to ease the rebirth of the deceased person. The corpse is carried around the stupa, the three-dimensional mandala of the cosmos. There is no set number of circuits, but more is better, since that represents more sutra recitations. After midday, the Larun Valley echoes to the sound of sutras read over a loudspeaker. Students line the streets, chanting the sutras. The Bardo Todo, the Tibetan Book of the Dead, tells what awaits the dead in the afterlife and how to facilitate rebirth. Thirty or so monks have gathered in this hall with the corpses that have been carried around the stupa. Here, too, they recite the Book of the Dead. The corpses are then carried to the western ridge of the Larun Valley for a Tibetan Buddhist funerary rite called Sky Burial. The charnel ground is guarded by three skeletal protective deities. However different in life, all become equal once death strips flesh from bones. One by one, the corpses are carried into the ground. No family members accompany them. It's thought the presence of loved ones might cause the spirits of the dead to linger in this world and delay their journey into the afterlife. Large birds begin to circle in the sky above. Vultures. About 100 of the flesh-eating birds land and wait. A man sets to work on the corpses with a knife. He is the sky burial master. The people who brought the corpses silently observe his work from a distance. The moment the work of preparing the bodies is complete, the vultures rush over and begin to feed. For us Tibetans, this custom of offering your whole body to feed the birds is a religious act that gains merit, a practice that will help you to be reincarnated on a higher level. As the birds eat all the flesh, they are also stripping away and purifying all the wickedness that person may have committed in the course of their life on earth. For Tibetan Buddhists, the body is something lent to us by the gods to use during our life in this world. After death, it is merely an object, happily given to the birds as a final act to accumulate merit. It's also natural to offer one's body to the vultures, since they are believed to be incarnations of the gods. The sky burial master crushes any remaining bones so the birds can eat them too. Virtually nothing is left of the corpse after a sky burial. Any scraps the vultures leave will be eaten by smaller birds. When nothing is left behind, there is purity. All that remains of us is the wisdom that we have learned and the experiences we have had in this life. 
Tibetan Buddhism teaches us that within the inner heart of the human mind is what we call the Eighth Consciousness. This lies on a deeper plane than the consciousness of self and existence. It is the core of our personhood, the storehouse consciousness. You could think of it as a database in which wisdom and experience are stored and which remains even after the death of our physical body. This is what preserves that wisdom and experience through all the cycles of death and rebirth. The Eighth Consciousness is a fundamental concept in Tibetan Buddhism. The eight levels, moving from outermost to innermost, are the five senses of sight, sound, smell, taste and feel, followed by mental consciousness of the self. The seventh consciousness constitutes delusions or worldly desires. The deepest layer, the eighth, is the storehouse consciousness in which our karma resides. This storehouse consciousness is like a spiritual DNA passed on through each reincarnation. Sky burial leaves only the storehouse consciousness to pass on to the next world as the seed of the mind. The Larunga Institute is the world's largest Tibetan Buddhist school, with 20,000 student monks and nuns training here. This long wall running straight up the slope of the valley divides the men's and women's living quarters. The women all live on the left side of the wall, the men on its right. Fraternization between male and female students is strictly prohibited, and anyone transgressing is fined about $70. During the day, students can pass freely between the two sectors, but the gates are locked at night. Facilities like the clinic and post office operate on different days and hours for men and women. There is electricity in the Lorong Valley, but outages are frequent. There is no gas, so heating and cooking are done by burning dried turf or animal dung. The student quarters have no plumbing. All water must be drawn from the valley's ten wells. This well is for women only. It's a natural spring, bubbling up from deep below the Tibetan plateau. That's why the water doesn't freeze, even when the surface temperatures fall below minus 20 degrees. This was one of the main reasons why Jigme Punsak chose this location for his institute. Every day, students must climb the stone stairs between their quarters and the wells to fetch water. The green plastic container on this woman's back weighs 20 kilograms. The filmmaker received special permission to film in the women's quarters. This is Ishi Wangmo, who has been studying here for six years. She used to work in a garment factory. It was a book by Tsutim Lodu Kempo, the institute's head of instruction, that inspired her to come here and become a nun. Doesn't water freeze outside in the winter cold? Yes, that's why I wash and hang out my clothes as soon as I fetch the water. Oh. Don't your wet clothes freeze? Yes, they become like a block of ice. But there's some sun today, so it will be fine. <laughs> Please come in. 
<laughs> Ishi Wangmo's quarters consist of a single dirt floored room two meters square. There's a bed where her stuffed animals sit, an altar, and some bookshelves. Since she wears nuns' robes all year long, she has almost no other clothes. About how much do you spend each month on living expenses? My personal expenses? Well, it varies, of course. But if I'm careful, I can keep it to around $30. Do you work at all? No, since I became a nun, all I do is study. I don't have a job. So where does your money for living come from? I'm given a regular scholarship by the Institute. Does that cover everything you need? Yes. For the most part, Students' living expenses are paid out of donations to the Institute. They eat twice a day. Students cook their own evening meals in their quarters. They take turns preparing the communal midday meal. In this huge cauldron, they are cooking a gruel of mushrooms and milk. Each student is given one bowl in the break between study sessions. The amount is small, but it contains butter to boost the nutritional content. The institute owns no farms or livestock. Everything is brought in from outside the valley. Local villagers hawk their wares along the main street. These include tsampa, the staple food of Tibet, as well as steamed buns and vegetables. Students are free to purchase whatever food they like. Do you find life difficult here? Mm, well, it's a very basic life compared to the outside world. We get only two meals a day, and each is just one dish. But actually, that is plenty to live on. It's so very different from my life when I was a child, and it was certainly a shock when I first came here. So yes, I have sometimes thought about all the things I'm giving up, family, job, money, and all that. But really, all those things we think we possess are nothing more than persistent illusions. The more I studied Buddhism, the more I realized that my previous way of thinking was completely flawed. Changing my life was necessary, but not enough. I needed to devote a lot of time to study spiritual things. During the day, I read by the light from the window. At night, I need the electricity. Ishi Wangmo has been a formal student here for six uninterrupted years. She plans to stay and study for the rest of her life. Training begins in the morning and continues even after sundown. At 7.30 p.m. after dinner, the students gather in the sutra halls again for their debating practice. This method of debating is unique to Tibetan Buddhism. Students pair up and trade questions. As they debate and analyze the Buddhist principles they learn from the sutras, they become able to distinguish truth from error and see the essence of things. By debating wide-ranging and constantly changing topics, students hone their ability to think on their feet. This teaches them how to maintain control over anger 
to think and debate calmly in the face of hostile and aggressive questioning. It's quite common for these debate sessions to continue far into the night. July 2012. The brief summer has come to the Eastern Tibetan Plateau. Even so, the average temperature is just 9.9 .9 degrees and the breeze through the open car window is chilly. A herd of yaks is grazing in a pasture near the Laron Valley. The yak is a bovine animal that can only live at high altitudes, between 3,000 and 6,000 meters. Tibetans use them as beasts of burden and for plowing. They make yak fur into clothing, eat their meat, and burn their dung as fuel. The yak is an essential part of Tibetan life. After gathering their yaks, the herder family warm up in their tent. Even in summer, a stove is always kept burning. They've hung photos of famous llamas on the main tent pole. These are the photos of the llamas that I most respect. I hang them here to provide protection for our home. And when we die, these llamas will greet us and guide us in the afterlife. Passing a mountainside draped in prayer flags, the car enters the Laron Valley. In the over 30 years since the founding of the Institute, the growing number of students has brought increased diversity. There are students of all origins and ages, with many different reasons for choosing this path. In this hall, a sutra is being chanted in Chinese. This is a lecture for ethnic Han Chinese students. The sutras are taught in Chinese using Chinese course materials. A yellow cloth barrier separates men and women students. A growing number of Han Chinese have been entering the institute to take Buddhist vows. Chen Shun is a 50-year-old Han Chinese who joined one year ago. In her earlier life, she worked for a Chinese company in Germany. Society today is devoted to pursuing growth based on materialism. A greed is good philosophy has taken over everyone's minds. I just see this as sinful. When I was working, I felt nothing but anxiety at having to be a part of such a society. My days were spent caught up in worldly things, living only to work. I had no true goals. I felt my soul was empty and always agitated. I'm so glad I came here because now my heart is always at peace. The law of the Buddha has a wisdom which no one can deny. This is a philosophy that contains no contradictions. I studied all the classic works on philosophy and I found that they all contain contradictions. But there are no contradictions in Buddhist thought. We can say that Buddhism is the very definition of truth. The Chinese language classes were started in 1996 by the Institute's founder, Jigme Puntsok, in order to cope with surging numbers of Han Chinese wanting to become monks and nuns. This follows the command of the Buddha to teach the path to enlightenment to all who seek it. All are welcome to study at Larun, wherever they come from.
On this day too, there are sky burials with fresh corpses to be offered to the waiting vultures. This is Sewan Rinjin, one of the three sky burial masters in the Lurun Valley. The purpose of the sutra, say one is chanting, is to ensure the dead fully understand that they have died. This will assist their swift reincarnation. From age 12 to 16, Tse Wan learned the trade of sky burial master from his father. One of these vultures is an incarnation of the goddess Kandroma. The birds all sit quietly and listen as I chant the sutras. Kandroma knows that I am a sky burial master, and so the birds never attack me. During his apprenticeship, Tse Wan walked to sky burial sites all over the region, learning skills such as how to handle the vultures and to cut up the corpses. He stayed in 108 caves, the traditional Buddhist number of the human passions. I still stay in this cave when I'm studying. Here's our stove. We burn firewood here to cook with. Inside the cave, he splits the fee for today's ritual with his fellow sky burial masters. These men are not Buddhist monks. It's a secular occupation. Tsewan's house is a short ride from La Runga. He's building a two-story wooden house. It's not completed yet, but his family is already living in it. Oh, how cool. Sewan has a wife and young son. His wife comes from the same village as Sewan. They have known each other since childhood. <laughs> <laughs> Do you read sutras here? This is an altar to His Holiness, Jigmi Punsak Rinpoche of Larungar. I use this flute to summon Kandroma. When I blow it, the vultures come from the sky to the burial ground. I made it from the thigh bone of a young Buddhist nun. She died when she was only 17 years old. How did you make it? First I carefully removed all the flesh, then I hollowed out the bone. I blow it in the ritual where I chant the sutras. What is that next to it? A skull. I drink milk from it. And I use it for eating yogurt, rice, I eat anything out of it. Why do you do that? I'm a sky burial master, so I'm expected to be able to do these things. Ordinary people would be afraid of it. But for me, it's a very natural thing to do. It's a matter of pride for us. Oh. <laughs> 
The most skilled of the sky burial masters that Sewan trained with were able to summon the exact number of vultures they needed for each burial. Tsewang hopes that he will reach that level someday. Tibetan Buddhism thinks of people, animals, and everything else in the natural world as being in a state of constant motion, like the wind. We humans are a part of the natural world and part of nature's cycle. Sky burial is designed to facilitate that cycle. Tibetan Buddhists use other kinds of funerary practices too, such as cremation, water burial, and interment. Which is chosen depends first of all on the expressed wishes of the deceased, secondly on divination, and thirdly on the cause of death. Most people ask for a sky burial in order to gain merit for their next life through their final act. Ishi Wangmo, the nun whose quarters we visited, walks down a street at the institute. <laughs> Granny, I'm here. Recently, she has been visiting the home of an old woman. The old woman moved here from a nearby village two months ago. I brought you milk. Thank you. You're a great help. Sit down, Granny. <laughs> Tell him how old you are. Me? Yes. I'm 93. I prefer living here to living at home because of my deep belief. My family tells me to come home, but I won't. Don't catch cold. Wang Mo used to work in a factory in a big town. Since she came to the institute, she has found herself more able to extend kindness toward other people. It's late October, and snow on the peaks means the harsh Tibetan winter is on its way. But this is also the season when people throughout the region enjoy festivals to celebrate the gathering of the harvest. Many make a pilgrimage to the Larun Valley for the Great Autumn Dharma Assembly. This great festival, or puja, lasts a whole week. These pilgrims come from all over the region and as far away as Beijing and Shanghai. The first place the pilgrims go is the stupa. Pilgrims ring the bells at the stupa's entrance to announce their arrival to the Buddha enshrined in the palace here, the center of this three-dimensional mandala. Throughout the week of the Dharma assembly, these prayer wheels never stop spinning. The lamas mingle with the pilgrims, reciting sutras and accepting donations from the faithful.
In several locations, huge pots are bubbling. This is buttered tea made using milk given as offerings by the pilgrims. The tea is served free of charge to monks and pilgrims alike. This is the first day of the Autumn Dharma Assembly, the Pure Land Puja. This puja or festival is held to call on the Buddhas to save all suffering people and open their minds to enlightenment and liberation from worldly passions. Liberation from the cycle of reincarnation is considered the ultimate bliss, entry to the pure land. The voices of 40,000 pilgrims merge with the chanting of the monks. In the central square, monks raise a gigantic tanka or scroll painting. It depicts the Pure Land Paradise with Amida Buddha at the center. Chanting sutras, the crowds begin waving pieces of cloth over their heads. These are prayer scarves known as kata. For Tibetans, katas express devotion. Waving a kata is a way to honor and give thanks to the Buddha. Throughout the long day, nothing interrupts the continuous reciting of the sutras. At a certain point, everyone starts throwing their katas toward the front of the crowd. Scarves are passed hand to hand until they reach the monks seated in the center of the square. These offerings symbolize people's faith in the Buddha and their prayers for peace in the next life. After the great autumn festival is over, people return to their villages to prepare for the long cold winter. And in the Larone Valley, this major stronghold of Tibetan Buddhism, the monks and nuns return to their daily routine, the pursuit of enlightenment and liberation. <laughs>